Hello everyone, my name is Joshua McDonald, a student at the Wyant College of Optical Sciences. I've worked in the holography lab for the past four years, and I want to talk to you guys about holography or holograms. So, the first question that we always ask everyone is, what do you think is a hologram? Because everyone has the idea of a hologram in their mind, but does it really match up with what is really technically a hologram. So I've got a couple examples up here. We have the first one, which is a, which is what's been told as a pocket hologram, um, where you can essentially put this little pyramid on your phone or on another display and have a sort of object, like a I've seen a jellyfish, I've seen another pyramid, I've even seen a minion floating in there. Um, we've seen that be taught it as a hologram. Uh, number two, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Princess Leia, Star Wars, we all know it, hopefully. Um, this, that, that's said to be a hologram. The one on the bottom left is you know, it's just a pretty simple display. It looks like some sort of holographic pattern that you have on your card. Um, is that really a hologram or, you know, is that sort of a fun illusion? Or what about in the bottom right with the uh, Microsoft HoloLens and having these sort of displays floating in front of you as you do your work? Um, kind of interacting with the environment around you. Um, so I'll go ahead and give you some time, think about your answer, and uh, we'll continue after a bit. All right, so if you said that number three was a hologram, you would be correct. The rest of these technically aren't holograms. The first one is a Pepper's Ghost, and if you want a cool video about that, uh, we might have one on the channel, or if not, a quick Google, a uh, quick search on YouTube, and you'll be able to learn all about it. It's really cool. Um, illusion that's been used in things like the Tupac ghost or uh, a sort of virtual idol called Hatsune Miku. The second one is what we would consider a volumetric display um, and that's because the light seems to be emitting from some sort of volume in 3D space and isn't really relying on diffraction and it can be seen anywhere plus it is dynamically changing and we'll talk to, we'll talk about the differences between a dynamic hologram and a static hologram at the end and the last one number 4 why this is incorrect is it's the same sort of idea it's not actually a hologram instead it's more augmented reality where it's changing the pers the relative size and the relative position in order to make it seem like these images are floating in space when really uh, they aren't and it's just sort of an optical illusion. So generally one of the things that we make a comparison between is a hologram and a photograph. They seem pretty different but uh, they do kind of the same thing in a sense. Uh, we can record an image, um, and from that image, it's static. It really doesn't change. Um, and then you have a bunch of photographs in order to get a video, and we can have a bunch of holograms to give us a, a holographic video. But what are the differences between 
these two types of technologies? Well, in a photograph, we can use any light. You can do it at night, you can do it in day, you can do it with your lamp, you can do it with your sun, with the sun. Um, as long as you have a source of light, you can take a picture. Uh, all of our traditional cameras have a lens attached to them in order to focus the light. There are pinhole cameras, which we have a video on the OSC site about, so go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, when we have made our picture and we want to look at it, we can see it in almost any light. It doesn't matter where we look at it or what perspective we look at it, as long as we have a source of light, pretty much we can view the image. The recording itself is destructive, and by that I mean when the photons interact with our film or our sensor, it, all that energy is absorbed and um, there's nothing more that can be done after that. The information of that photon is lost, is completely lost once that happens. Lastly, the image is limited by the recording medium or the film. So if I take a picture and I decide that when I print it out, I cut out specific portions of the picture, well, I can't recreate anything that's outside of my film. Versus holography, which uses a, co which needs a coherent source of light. Um, we'll talk about what a coherent source of light means here in a bit. Uh, it requires specific optical mechanisms in order to get really good holograms, such as vibration absorbing tables and um, very specific lasers, some very specific um, mechanisms for holding all the components. You can do it um, in your own house, but it starts to get kind of expensive or the pictures don't look the best. Plus, they require specific light in order to be seen. And we'll talk about that more when we uh, move on and talk about methods for recording holograms. The recording holograms is non destructive. Um, that's because we are worried about something called wavefront interference and not, how, and not just counting the number of photons in a specific spot. And lastly, the image is not limited by the recording medium. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. So one of the fancy terms that you heard me use is a wavefront. What exactly is a wavefront? So in photography, we worry about specific spots that just give off photons. Um, this could be a small bit of plasma, or this could be a cell. In your body and we'll see photons go left right out and center and we don't care where they go um, and we don't care the shape of that distribution of photons um, and this is generally an incoherent source um, and that's because everything is going about randomly this is different uh, from holography where we have a coherent point source where the light is coming out in a very specific manner. In this picture it's a radial source where you'll have these sort of radial lines across, consistent radial lines across all of the rays that are leaving it and these consistent lines um, across all the rays is our wavefront. Now this is just a simple point. What about more complex images? Because you should be able to do stuff with more complex images. Well, with a, with our tree, let's take our example to a tree. In photography, we just care about the number of photons. So we don't care how the light leaves the tree or uh, we just care that there, there's light leaving the tree versus holography where we get this more complex wavefront which is a combination of all of these smaller wavefronts which come from the smaller particles of the tree itself and that will propagate out farther and farther. And these are the sorts of things that we care about when recording a hologram. We'll 
and hopefully you'll see why here in a bit when we talk about recording holograms. So when we record a hologram, we'll generally use a method like this. It's not exactly optically correct, but uh, it'll get the job done. So what we do is we send a coherent source of light into our into our uh, interferometer here, or this setup, and you'll see our primary beam of light hit our tree, and we're worried about the specific portion of light that's reflected away from it and onto our recording media medium here in blue. But another small portion of light will leave will be reflected off of this glass right here and onto this mirror where it will also interact with our recording medium. And this difference in paths and wavefronts, since we talked about how this will create a more complex wavefront, is what's recorded on our recording medium or our film. But there is a meet easier method that we can use to record a hologram, and it's simply taking a coherent source of light through our medium and having all the light reflected back interact um, right on it. So what are the different types of holograms? Uh, if I take two coherent sources of light uh, like this and I say, all right, well, I'm going to expose this film and I'm going to leave it for a bit and once I'm done I pull away the sources of light and I am left with this hologram here in blue. What we can do is now put in our specific waves of light and from there we get out, well, we get out uh, the rest of the hologram. So if I put in our green source, what will end up coming out of our hologram is the orange source. Cool, right? Imagine if the orange source was our bottom beam and our green source was our tree. If we took the reflected light off the tree, we would expect to see a beam of light coming out of our recording medium. The same goes for a reflection hologram, except in terms of reflection, we would see the light coming out the other way. Now, what happens if we decide to put in the source of light, the recording source of light? Well, the same thing from our original um, animation, from our original uh, look at this, we would get out our green wavefront or our tree, and we would end up seeing our tree. The same goes for reflection, but instead of it being on the same, the opposite side, it would be on the same side. And this is where the importance of understanding the difference between a transmission and reflection hologram uh, sorts of kind of, kind of comes in. Another thing that's interesting about holograms is that we get parallax. And that's because we get the wavefront of the scene and not just a s single perspective. But what is parallax, you might be asking yourself. Well, parallax can be described as sort of the 3D effect of how we look at objects. Um, with a picture, you'll generally just see the image itself. And when you move your head left to right, you'll just get the picture. You won't be able to see uh, things in the background moving faster than the things in the foreground, which is how things normally look when we move... Um, sorry, things in the back will move slower than things in the front. Um, and that's how we normally see things, and that's considered parallax. Um, with holograms, because we're recording the wavefront of the scene, we can record the different aspects that you couldn't see with a normal photograph um, because the wavefront, even at a weird angle, is still interfering with our recording medium. 
and we'll show a demonstration of that later. But this video here should give a good idea of the difference between parallax and not having parallax and parallax. The R2 on the left is going to be our example of not parallax, or not a great example of parallax, where as you move left to right, you kind of see the sides of R2, but not really, versus the right, where you move around, and you really see the sides of R2-D2. We'll play this again. Um, and you can kind of see around the edges as you move from left to right. Um, and you can see in areas that you would not expect to see because your recording medium wasn't exactly there in order to get a picture of it. And that's the key uh, takeaway with parallax. Now, we talked about static versus dynamic holograms. One of the key factors in a hologram is that they are recorded and they generally don't change. Um, similar to a photograph, uh, you don't change a photograph after you've taken a picture. Granted, we have video editing, but the idea is still the same. A photograph is a static moment in time. A hologram is the same way. So, if we want to get a more dynamic hologram, or a video hologram, we need to be more clever. So, uh, we're going to quickly look at this video here that I, had in this, that I have here in the presentation. It's by Jerry Ellsworth, and... Uh, she has some amazing content about holograms. Um, this is just a small clip section. So this shows off everything we've been talking about, where we have that complex wavefront um, of the tiger here and the sand that it was sitting on, and we put in this specific light, and based off of its location and the angle that we put it in, we get a specific part of the hologram out, or the specific part of the tiger's wavefront out. Um, and she has an example of having light from the back and it still produces the tiger um, on the glass itself and as it's transmitted through. And that's the difference between a, generally this is still a transmission hologram because um, the light that's put in is shown on the opposite side of the medium. But as you move the laser around, you still get all of that extra parts of the image that you wouldn't have normally seen. Um, and if we cut off uh, specific sections of this hologram, you could still reconstruct um, more parts of the image. And all she's doing is moving the laser to sections to give us the clearest picture. Um, this also shows parallax again, um, and just some of the cool things about holograms, or a cool static hologram. So just going and watching some of her videos, um, she's, she uh, has some great content. All right, now in our lab, what we're working on is creating dynamic holograms or, or kind of video holograms, getting hologram, holographic displays to a video format. And the way we have to do this is record holograms faster, similar to displays um, and movies, which just show a bunch of pictures really fast. We have to figure out a way to make holograms really fast and 
uh, display them really fast. So in this example it shows how we can record a hologram super fast by just sliding it across this uh, laser and from there we get all the same aspects of a hologram. We move left to right, we get the parallax, we get the 3D effects, um, it's still waveforms and all of that. And what we do after that is, after a hologram is recorded, is we generally um, not destroy the medium, but we remove current from the medium, which is holding the hologram in position or holding the recording medium in the orientation to have the hologram in it, and we record something else. And this is that same exact medium here in the back that was shown in the demonstration on the left and as you can see it's a completely different hologram and the work that's being done in terms of trying to get us to a holographic display is determining the tech trying to figure out the technology in order to take our recording from uh, 50 Hertz down to uh, 60 Hertz and this is 50 Hertz per uh, little line and you see that here in the bottom um, it actually took 2 minutes 15 the goal is to get that down to a 1 30th of a second so that's the sort of technology that's being worked on in order to get us holographic displays uh, similar, I'm sorry I don't have any cool demos for you to do at home. Holography is one of those really cool technologies that can be really difficult to do at home. But I really wanted to share some of the awesome aspects of holograms and at least give you a in-depth, not, not sorry, um, overview of some of the cool aspects of holography and what's being done with it and really what it means for things to be a hologram versus a trick on the eye that corporations and other people will just say is a hologram. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments down below, and myself or someone else from the College of Optical Sciences will hopefully answer it as soon as possible. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Until next time.